Good evening and welcome to a very special Take 20 interview. Today's guest is our American Dental Association Executive Director, Dr. Kathy O'Laughlin. I want to let everyone know that this is streaming live on our International College of Dentists USA section Facebook page and will be archived there so that if you happen to catch us after we've stopped streaming live, you can still watch us. We also archive all of our videos on the ICDUSA.org website under the events tab on the top. We love knowing who's watching us. And of course, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments box in the Facebook page under the interview. We do try to get to as many questions as you can. And if you don't have a question and you just want to say hello, please make sure you do that. We like to see who's watching us. Welcome, Dr. O'Laughlin. Good evening and uh, thank you, Amarita, for the invitation. This sounds like it'll be some fun. I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you, um, even though I know that you have lots and lots of fans. Dr. Kathy O'Laughlin is the Executive Director of the American Dental Association, the nation's leading advocate for oral health. She joined the ADA in 2009 after serving as the Chief Dental Officer for the United Health Group and the Chief Executive Officer for Delta Dental of Massachusetts. She is a nationally recognized leader in the healthcare, nonprofit, and education sectors, and she speaks around the country about the profession of dentistry, oral health care delivery, and public health policy. Dr. O'Loughlin was the first female dental school class president and valedictorian of the Tufts University School of Dental Medicine. Again, if anyone has any questions, please leave them in the comments box below. Make sure to say hi if you don't have any questions and we're gonna roll right into it. You have such an amazing career path. Tell us what attracted you to executive level management in dentistry. I wouldn't call it a career path as much as I accidentally fell into things. So let me give you a little uh, history. So I started out after high school, of course, college, nursing school. And then I worked um, at Mass General Hospital for about seven years. And I started to get a little bit of wanderlust. You know, what else could I do? This is nice, I like it, I love the patients, but I think I can do more with my life. And I got some advice from a physician that I worked with. And, and her advice was, dental school is a lot more civilized than medical school for women because you can control your hours and control your life. And at that time, this is back in the 70s, she was probably right. So my husband had a business in Boston, so I couldn't move out of the city. So basically I applied to three dental schools, all in Boston, um, got accepted. And my first day in dental school was a little scary because I hadn't sat for an exam or a class in almost nine years, right? I, I was out working. And uh, after I overcame the terror of being surrounded by a hundred and 56 men and having 12 women in my class, very small number of women. Uh, I kind of got over it and decided um, that I'd make a go of it. I loved dental school, loved every minute of it, loved uh, the experience. And that is quite unusual for people going to dental school in the 70s. Um, the fact that I actually say I loved it, they're like, what? It's the worst th three or four years of my life. Um, so I got out of dental school and had a baby the day I graduated which didn't help my career path at all. Um, so I became a mom and it immediately was very difficult for me to find a job. And it was really interesting that um, men were not anxious to hire a young woman with a, with a, a baby. Um, I'm not sure what they were thinking would happen, uh, but it, and I'll give you an example of an interview question. What will you do if your baby gets sick? And, and it was a, a man interviewing me. And I said, well, what do you do when you're kiddo gets sick. Well, my wife takes care of the baby. And I said, well, maybe she'll take care of my baby too. I'm not making this up. Obviously I didn't get the job. So uh, then I, I actually had a chance to take uh, uh, a residency in a public health hospital in uh, right outside of Boston, actually in Brighton. That was the most wonderful experience you can imagine. I was there for about six, seven years. I was surrounded by specialists. It was a hospital-based practice. So the the primary care physicians were right across the hallway. There were nurses there. Um, it was a terrific learning experience. I gained a lot of technical experience. I, I had a, an oral surgeon there, an endodontist there, a periodontist right there. So I could ask them anything. 
and it was a de Department of Defense site, so we could do a lot of dentistry um, and, and not worry about how it was paid for because it was a Department of Defense site. Right. And great experience. Um, but, you know, I had been interested in having my own practice. Most young dentists want to own, ultimately. So I started working two nights a week and Saturdays in my hometown. My dad was a dentist, but he unfortunately passed away when I was in dental school. But his patients kept bugging my family about when is, you know, Kathy coming back. So I, I said, well, I can try it out two nights a week and Saturdays. My husband was great at, at helping with daycare, childcare. And um, it turned out after a few years of that, it, it got busy enough for me to start a full-time practice in Medford. So that was, um, that was pretty much how I got started in dentistry. And don't look back on it with regret one single minute. Loved it, loved it, loved it. After 20 years, um, I got hit with a little wanderlust again and decided I wanted to go back and expand my education. So I went back to school and got a public health degree with a, a focus in healthcare management because I actually enjoyed the business stuff more. I mean, the patient care was getting easy because after 20 years, you get pretty good at it and you know how to treat cases and you are good at treatment planning and all that. Um, so I decided the business side might be a challenge and, and I getting some added skills, really, I enjoyed every minute of the business side. And that opened the door to a new opportunity when there was a change in leadership and structure at the Delta Dental Plan. I had been on the board for a number of years and they turned to me and said, would you like to be a part-time, you know, interim CEO while we reorganize the company? And I wasn't there a year when it became you know, a real job. And I, I asked uh, my partners at the time, you know, how do you feel about me leaving the practice? And, and I think they were, might have been very happy I was ready to leave. So off I went, um, they bought the practice. It's still operating. Uh, Janice Moriarty, I think is in this call and she runs the practice in Winchester, Massachusetts. And um, it's still a terrific practice. So so that's my career path. It was accidental opportunity grabbing, of course, with permission from my family. I mean, they weren't terribly excited when I decided at 48 to go back to a public health program. Uh, but, you know, it worked out. And that led to United Health Group, and then that led to the ADA. So here I am. I'm in my 11th year. As I was saying before the call started, I'm getting ready to retire. I've had a great run at the ADA, loved every minute of it, uh, but I will be retiring at the end of this year in December. And I feel like I have one more job uh, in me. So who knows where I'll end up next, but that's been my career path. It wasn't planned uh, at all. And my advice is the dental degree gets you set off in such a great direction. And you can do so much with it. Uh, don't forget to keep looking for opportunities along your way because you don't have to settle for being stuck. You, you can experiment and take risks and try things. And dentistry is a fabulous career. I mean, that's what changed my life. So I really owe it to everyone um, in my career pathing, you know, to keep pushing me forward and saying, sure, try it out. What have you got to lose? Right. So that's how my mentors were to me. They were they described me as a cliff jumper and I would jump off a cliff without really knowing where I landed, but I always landed. So. Right. What was the last year like for you with the pandemic personally? It was scary, horrible, scary. So we in January last year started hearing anecdotal stories from other countries about what was going on with this uh, beauty of the novel coronavirus, you know, SARS-CoV-2. I didn't even know what that was a year and a half ago. So we started chatting with our peers in Wuhan, China. And with the public health degree, I had public health contacts in dentistry in many parts of the world through our in, uh, international involvement, just like ICD. We were uh, part of the FDI, the Federation Dentaire International. So we had lots of colleagues we were talking with. And our colleagues in Italy really got my attention. They really raised the alarm. You know, we, we had not seen a case in the US, but China was roaring, right? But it's China, it's 3000 miles away. 
Europe started getting hit and the Italian Dental Association um, uh, ED called me and said, we have a problem. We have a massive outbreak of, of novel coronavirus and it is killing people. It's killing our elderly at remarkable rates and it's coming your way. It's spreading through Europe like nothing. So we, um, we got alarmed and we started looking into the science behind all the coronaviruses because we had familiarity with SARS, we had familiarity with MERS, but this new one was a beast in terms of transmissibility and how it was carried from one person to another. And we contacted Don Milton, who is a, a, a very well-known aerosol infectious disease expert at the University of Maryland. He was extraordinarily helpful. He scared me to death because of the, the spread of this disease. And if you had it and you had comorbid conditions or were elderly, it was a death sentence because we had no treatments back then, right? I mean, a year it's been, it made a huge difference. So it was a very scary time. We, we didn't know what we were dealing with. Here is February, March. We're starting to think dental practices could be a very high risk environment for spread of disease. We had survived the HIV crisis back in the 80s. And you know, one dental transmission and your reputation as a profession is cooked, right? The public say, I'm not coming, it's not safe. So we wanted to protect the patients and the practices at all costs. And, that, and what really made us um, do very quickly is get the facts, get the science, get the validation, work with CDC and start pumping out guidance to dentists on how to open safely and how to convince legislators dentists could open safely and, but that period from March until May was probably the darkest period in my career at, at ADA. So many angry dentists, they were so scared, so upset, they couldn't earn a living. Students who needed jobs couldn't find paying employment. Uh, how am I gonna pay that back my student loan? You know, all kinds of issues. And to ask practices voluntarily to reduce your practice to the bare minimum and 95% of them complied. It was an amazing example of dentist courage and resilience to do that and to deal with all the uncertainty. So our job really became getting them back open as fast as we could. And that was our focus from March until May. And by May, practices were coming back online and we started tracking how they were doing in terms of recovery. And the great news was we our observation was dental practices were recovering much faster than medical elective surgic, surgical care. They really were stuck in a bind because they, they were depending on hospitals and ambulatory care centers to open where our practices for the most part could make their own decisions. And community health centers were coming back online too, but at a much slower pace. And we really found that employee dentists were very vulnerable during all of this. And so we, we really scrambled to try and assist them. We started lobbying for loan abatement programs, um, you know, uh, suspension of loan payments to the federal government, you know, pushing through PPE loans so you could pay your staff, getting a dentist in, in the legislation was a struggle. Nobody considered them healthcare workers. I mean, that was actually a surprise to the feds and FEMA. So it was an amazing journey from, I would say, March 6th to where we are today in terms of how far we've come. Um, we're still not out of it. This is our recovery year. Dentists will recover. We don't know if it's 80, 85, 90, 95, all the way to 100% because we don't think the logistics will change too much. Remember during HIV, once you started autoclaving handpieces and wearing gloves and a mask and a gown and glasses, you never went back. Um, I think the same situation here will be that people will continue to observe aerosol uh, as, as, as something to be careful of. Um, they will probably continue to wear N95 masks or KN95s. They will continue to be cognizant of infectious disease spread in their waiting areas and everything. So uh, we'll come back. It's just I don't think we'll come back exactly the way we were pre-COVID. So in my experience, it was the scariest darn year in my life in the ADA, um, but it's also a crisis we, we learned from. We got better at things. 
We displayed tremendous courage and resilience. We started meeting our member needs much faster. Uh, dentists know much better now what we do for them. And uh, we have a much stronger relationship with the states and the local dental societies who desperately needed the information we were pumping out. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it was, uh, what is that quote from Tale of Two Cities? Tale of Two Cities, it was, a, it was a wonderful time and it was a desperate time, right? So that's kind of how we experienced it. And as we move further into 21, I'm looking forward to when we can reconvene and have face-to-face -face meetings again because dentists love to be together. We do. Yep. Yeah. I was I was just saying it to someone today, man. I miss sitting at that bar at the Ritz in Chicago. I do too, Emrita. I can't <laughs> wait to buy a martini for you in Chicago over the next <laughs> Oh, I can't wait. And can't. the sad thing is the Ritz actually closed. I and heard. At the same time we were closed. Yeah. So we didn't even have that to go sneak out to, right? <laughs> I miss that walk in the freezing cold over the ADA building. <laughs> the I know, but your reward was a cocktail at the bar, right? Yeah, so many. Yep. Um, what was it like for your team to switch the ADA's annual session from an on-site meeting to a virtual meeting in such a short period of time last year? Was there anything that you learned that would be a positive addition to future on-site annual sessions? Well, it was not fun. I can tell you that. We had to continue to plan for face-to-face -face because we didn't know. And at the same time, we had to start planning for virtual and we had never done that. And right. no one had ever done that. So we were in uncharted territory. Uh, we launched our virtual meeting after making the decision that October was not safe and that we couldn't risk going to Orlando. Florida was the epicenter for a surge, if you remember back in October. I mean, uh, there was very little mask wearing. Uh, <laughs> there was no social distancing. People were still congregating together. And, and the fact that we would put people, you know, 10 or 20,000 people in, our, in, the, in the amusement parks uh, really was kind of concerning. So we made the decision. Uh, it was a very hard decision. It cost us a ton of money to give up that annual meeting. But we, we felt we had no choice. We couldn't guarantee safety for attendees. And we couldn't guarantee that it would um, possibly damage our reputation if we did have a transmission. Uh, for some of you on this um, uh, video, uh, the Biogen had a terrible problem in Boston. They held a meeting in February with that. some large number of people, and they had an extraordinary number of transmissions. Extraordinary. And they basically carried the disease from yep. that locus in Boston to all over the country and internationally. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, ADA did not want to have that happen and have our reputation as a health provider association on the line. So we canceled. It was painful. Uh, we are looking forward to having a fabulous meeting in um, uh, up, coming up in La Las Vegas, woohoo, in October. So we're pushing for things like vaccinations, pre and post testing, uh, screening, you know, social distancing, mask wearing. Yeah, smile con. We want this to be the party of all time because we are so desperate for that party. And the point of this reimagined meeting will be networking and fun come first and then the learning. And that's a complete flip of our traditional model. So we're really looking forward to this as party central. This might be the first large meeting to be held um, once we emerge from the pandemic and it's safe. So we're keeping our fingers crossed Hopefully, we'll know more as we get a little bit closer to the middle of the summer. But if all goes well, we're going to be having this meeting. So keep your fingers crossed for us. I'm keeping everything crossed because I really miss networking with everyone. <laughs> yeah, and Las Vegas can be a fun place to hang out and, and have fun. It can. Uh, so we're really looking forward to it. And we're yeah. doing some really great, exciting things. The new dentist committee is really working with us and... We're going to offer some uh, diversity and inclusion kind of opportunities, uh, opportunities to showcase um, inclusion in new ways. And I, I think it'll be a lot of fun, a lot yeah. of fun. Um, what are some of the goals you would like to see happen in 2021 for the ADA? We just want to recover. Uh, COVID cost us $13 million and 2,100 members. <sighs> that was a big hit. We closed the financial gap by just cutting expenses everywhere. We're ending the 20 year break even, which is a miracle. 
And we're moving forward very quickly to recoup those members that for a million reasons dropped out of membership. And we totally understand why. I mean, it was a tough year for everyone. So we're focused on recovery, both financially, membership wise. We are uh, ramping up our work around um, social justice issues, Medicare, Medicaid. We're ramping up our work on inclusion and diversity and uh, continuing with the great work our Science Institute did all through COVID, just you know, gathering data and, and evidence and packaging it up so dentists can get their hands on the right evidence at the right time and apply it in their practices uh, fast. So, so we're very excited about 21, but you know, we still have a lot of uncertainty about what this disease is gonna do next and the variants are concerning as is the uneven vaccination that's going on. And, and I know you wanted to talk about that at some point. Yeah, um, you know, I, how, how is the administration of a vaccine being handled in your area? Well, I'm in Illinois part of the time. I, I went to Maine to a vacation house to see my kids basically who, I'm from Boston originally, so basically came back to see my kids. So in Maine, for example, they're doing an amazing job vaccinating people. In Massachusetts, not quite so. So even state to state, it's very uneven. I think if it depends on how the governors set up the vaccination programs in every state. And as you know, 50 states, two territories plus DC, there's 53 different ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. And every state seems to have decided to do their own thing. Right. So in Illinois, the major health systems have the virus, have the vaccine, and they are contacting their patients and they're using the tiers that the federal government recommended. Elderly, people with comorbid conditions, people over 65, and then they're working their way down the list. So the first who got the vaccine were the healthcare workers, right? The immediate. And so dentists in Illinois are getting vaccinated. Good. And the hospitals are reaching out to people at risk. Like my staff are not healthcare providers. So I've got 400 and, you know, 30 something people who are not eligible to receive the vaccine. But I'm hearing now that this week they're being contacted if they're 65 and over or if they have comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm optimistic that by the summer, we'll have a, a good number of people in Illinois vaccinated. Uh, but I wish it was faster. One of the reasons we're still on remote working and we sent everyone remote March 6th, not just the dentals. We sent all my employees remote. We've been working off of laptops for almost a year now and never missed a beat with working together, but we haven't been in the building for a year. Wow. Yeah. So we're looking forward to getting back and seeing each other. It's been tough on, I think, emotional wellness. It's been, it's very, very isolating. If you can imagine an ADA employee living alone in a condo and right. never seeing anybody. So we've, we've learned that we can work remotely really well. You don't have to live in Chicago to work for the ADA. We've learned that. We've learned that being flexible is an attribute we all need to keep in mind. We, we got rid of a lot of employee rules because they didn't apply and people have performed better than they've ever done. So uh, the ADA had to really rethink and change its way of uh, managing the business, but so far so good and, and everything we've learned, we're gonna continue if it's good and discard if it's not so good. We, yeah. do, we do worry a lot about the burnout and the emotional well-being because, as you know, you can work a lot more hours when you never leave your home. Yes. And if you have your office in with your bedroom, it's not healthy, right? Like there's no separation between work, play, and living. And we have had uh, uh, lots of evidence that the stress levels are unmanageable. And we, we've worked very hard to help not just the dentist manage stress, because we've been running a lot of mindfulness programs and wellness programs, but help our employees deal with the day-to-day -day stress of mm -hmm. not being in with a team, so. Right. Um, I know as far as, you know, Tara Lavic, who I speak to frequently because of the new dentist committee, and then Susie Galvan because of the IDL, they're doing an amazing job all remotely. I mean, there's no, there's no contact. They haven't even been in the building and you're right. They haven't missed a single beat, no matter what time of day I email or, or, or reach out to them. They're, they're still on it. So. And that's the problem. They are on it 24 yep. seven and that's actually becoming more of an issue. So 
Um, yeah, I don't want to know if you've got your slippers on or you've got yoga pants on. I don't care. As long as from here up, you look a little professional, you're good. Yeah. Um, so my biggest issue when we all get back, probably midsummer, uh, is how many people will be wearing cut off jeans, yoga pants and slippers to work? Which is what we've all been living in and what I'm wearing. I know. I mean, I have not put on a pair of high heel shoes for almost eight months. So right. there you and go. That was all we wore to all of our meetings. That was what we were <laughs> running around in between caucuses at the meeting. Oh, I hope I can still remember. walk in heeled shoes. I may Neither. never be able to walk in them again. I was looking at all my pretty heels and wondering if I, how much my feet are going to hurt that first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about it too. I'm worried about it. So, so I guess what I want to wrap up with is, are there any words of wisdom you would like to share with new graduates coming out into the dental world? Of course, new dentists are very close to my heart. So I wanted to know what you had to share with them. Well, you know, I graduated in 81, which was a very bad economic recession and, and things, you know, turned out okay. Uh, the graduates who graduated in 09 walked into a horrible recession and I think they're doing okay now and, and doing well. My advice is stay hopeful, stay optimistic. This is a terrible, terrible crisis, but you have support of all these people in organized dentistry to help hold your hand and watch your back and get you help. And um, it's a wonderful community. I mean, I just love being a dentist. I would never have thought I could ever love a profession this much. Even in my worst days, I still love what I do. So my advice is, Practice mindfulness. Don't worry. Worrying doesn't help you. The only thing you can control is yourself and lean on your friends and your organized dentistry community for help and support because we're here to help. That's, that's why we exist. So, yeah. And I'm so glad that you said that because we definitely believe in the, in the power of the camaraderie and networking and all the peers that, and the friends that you make through organized dentistry, which personally for me has been one of the most valuable and rewarding parts of this journey. Um, so thank you for saying that. I'd want to recognize a couple people that are watching with us. Dr. Osborne from Tennessee, Janice is on, um, Lisa is on, Joe Keneally says, good to see you. We had some great experiences in, in Tufts. It was awful and wonderful. <laughs> well, we had a lot of fun, but I'm not going to even describe the kind of silliness we got into because <laughs> My husband, all right, one side aside, I was married when I went to dental school and my husband's most important job was to get the beer every Friday for rounds. Oh that gosh. was his most important job. He became the class hero because of that. By the time I graduated, they liked him better than they liked me. I love it. That's awesome. He was the one always going on beer runs. Um, Margot Kalana Norton says, very impressive mom, dentist, and executive in several business ventures. Thank you for all you have done for dentistry and women. Um, Simran Grover says, thank you for all your help and support for de the dental profession. We've got lots and lots of people thanking you. Dr. Wagner, our registrar, says thank you, ADA, for your proactive communication during the early months of COVID. Um, lots and lots of thanks. And, and Joe Keneally is uh, interjecting with, wait, the Ritz in Chicago has a bar? Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, oh, Joe, your nose just got longer. Seriously. Like, that's Seriously. where we are if you can't find us. That's where we are. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, but I think that's why uh, we love organized dentistry, right? Because yeah. it connects you. It you you have these friends that are amazing for life, and what a rich community it is for us as dentists, right? It's Nobody so ever told me that would happen when I went to dental school, but yeah. it just happens. So yeah. terrific. Yeah. And, you know, I, both my best friends from dental school moved to California and I was like, now what? I've lost my people. I lost my <laughs> life raft. And then you connect with people through organized dentistry. And it's like, you know what? I still have my people. They're all still Exactly. Here. Exactly. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming on with me. We've got lots and lots of people watching and I know everyone really appreciated it. And of course, thank you for everything that you and the ADA have done for us with, over the last year. It's our privilege and honor. And I mean that. It is our honor to serve the profession and every one of my employees feels that way. So. Um, and hopefully I can see you at some point this year before SmileCon, if the world opens up again. All right. My, my bet is on midsummer, but don't hold me to it. But my right. bet is that conditions will improve to the point where by midsummer we'll be seeing some face-to-face -face meetings happening. All right. So get ready for the flood of dentists coming to the ADA <laughs> in about <laughs> July. With, with slippers and yoga pants. It might happen. Yeah. <laughs> So, All right, okay. Rita, it's always fun talking with you. So I'll see you soon. I think the IDL committee is meeting 
now, as a matter of fact. Yeah, we are, and we're trying to plan for when we're getting together in uh, person, and CDBP is doing the same thing, so hopefully something comes together before SmileCon and we can get back to Chicago. Right, well, good night, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you again. So to everyone who's watching, this interview will be archived again on the Facebook page, um, International College of Dentists USA section, and of course on our icdusasection.org um, website under the events tab at the top. Um, we've got some exciting guests coming up for March and April, March 3rd, 2021, Dr. Joe Keneally, which is uh, who serves as the Secretary General of the International College is going to be joining us. Um, our co-host for the evening will be our immediate past president, Dr. Jim Setterberg. On March 17th, also at eight, I am going to be doing another Take 10 to check in with our special guest who is Dr. Linda Edgar, um, the 11th District Trustee for the ADA. Um, April 7th, also at eight, Drs. Jonathan Copeland, Arnold Jacobson, and Herbert Silva will be our guests in Alive 45 to share more information about the exciting Veterans Dental Care Coalition Program. Um, this program actually has been awarded some grants from our USA Section Foundation, and my co-host will be our Vice President, Dr. Dan Freed. April 21st, also at 8, Dr. Regis, the recipient of our 2020 Outstanding Dental Leader Award, will be joining us for a special Take 20. He is also a past president of the ADA. And as always, remember to look out for future dates and guests in our upcoming emails, which are the key mails, here on Facebook and posted on our USA section website, which is usa-icd.org, over the events tab at the top. I want to thank everyone for tuning in, of course, and have a great and safe evening. Good night.